going to go slowly and steady. We have a new, a new motto now. It's calm in the cockpit. Sometimes we hold hands. It's fantastic. We're not going to get lost. We're going to win. Wonderful. This is another year, so this year we're going to have some uh, plenty of French wine. And we thought Paul Carter should win this year, it's his turn, so we've arranged that, so Paul's winning. Now Nigel says he's going to let you win this year, Paul. Nigel, it's, it's, it's the fat man in the Bentley we've got to watch out for, that's what Barry's been. He's uh, on fine form. Less, less so fat now, though. Uh, yeah, I know, yeah, six weeks. Look, looking pretty healthy. He's taking it seriously, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah, he is. Yeah, I know. Trying I know. to keep the weight down. All this calm in a cockpit nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Don't believe a word of it. Shouting and screaming. The first day's route will head out into the familiar farm lanes which form a maze around Ypres and then south and east across Belgium and into the Ardennes before arriving in Luxembourg for the first night's rest. Balfour and Howard Orchard get away from the Ypres Market Square to set the best time on the first test of that well-known mound amongst the flat fields of Flanders, Kemmelberg. Winter Challenge winner Jan Abus was second best, just four seconds adrift. Fancied runner Chris Rees was in his usual 1200 Anglia but the Sunday morning cyclists on Kemmel got in his way and 10th overall was the best he could do. Others simply went the wrong way. On the next test, Abus dropped just a single second to Balfour's 11, and this put him in the lead. Three crews were spot on in this test, including the Hartog Heemskirk Lancia and Roger and Maggie Byford in their MGB GT, and this lifted these two crews to second overall. Up three places to fourth came the Hunt Cook Kirkham MGB. Water on the ignition was a very real problem, so how about this as a novel way of keeping the sparks dry? The third test was in southern Belgium at a place called Froix Chapelle, and it was cold, way below September's norm. The Bifords dropped a massive 44 seconds here, leaving the Dutch in first and second positions, Hartog three seconds clear of Abus. Third overall last year, the Toes in their 356 had a disappointing start to the rally and would reach Luxembourg in 81st position. Into France now with a forest track for the next test and water everywhere. Abus moved into the lead ahead of Hartog, but one of the best drives came from Jeff Stewart in his Mark II Jaguar. A regular on the British Historic Championship scene, Jeff was on his first Classic Rally Association event. Honoré van der Meulen had been sixth best at Foix Chapelle, but there was no room for an E-type to get past at that point, and he paid the penalty. Very well, but we uh, the motor fell uh, down uh, oh, in, in, uh, in the ditch uh, in, in, the no, in the water. So uh, we had to restart it. Oh. It was a few minutes, but still going. Moving up to third overall here, the Canadian-American pairing of Tom Jones and Ralph Beckman in their Plymouth Barracuda. 
Up in the hills of North Luxembourg now, the screaming Saab, crewed by Rob Harvey Clark and Graham Greenwell, is 42nd overall. Mike Spindle has had more than his fair share of problems. Uh, we're fine, apart from um, the overdrive packing up, the shock absorber falling off, getting about 12 to the gallon, it's going like a dream. Another with a problem solved, Steve Morley Ham. We had a little bit of a mishap because we had the spare wheel on the boot lid on the luggage rack and uh, on one of the regularities there was a bit of a bump and I saw it in the mirror bouncing around down the road. So we've now got, we've thrown away the luggage rack, the spare tyres in the boot where it should be and the bags are behind the, the seats here so we're all sorted. Vesterman and Rosenblum ran well here dropping just four seconds but this last test of the day was to prove disastrous for the leader. Abus dropped a shed load of penalties, leaving his countryman Philip Hartog to drive his pretty Lancia Aurelia to Luxembourg City with a three second advantage over the Jones Beckman Barracuda, who was spot on. Arriving at the finish exactly 90 minutes 46 seconds after they started it. It's really not that big. It just, for us, it's a small car. In its era, it was uh, probably the smallest American car made, or within, you know, Mustang. Camaro, barracuda sized car. What size engine is it? It has a uh, 5.6 liter engine, which is a uh, small block. They made much larger engines for this car, for drag racing and for people who just wanted to go in a straight line. Yeah, there's no question it's a great car to rally. Uh, it's very fast. A little trouble coming down the hills to stop it, but going up we can go like a train. All kinds of horsepower. And on the tight turns, it may be a little big. You just kick the back end around and get on with the program. It's fun. The Luxembourg leaderboard looked like this. Hartog and Heemskirk led Jones and Beckman by three seconds, and they in turn had three seconds in hand over the Hunt Cook Kirkham MGB. The Irish pairing, Kerr and Cairns, were fourth ahead of recent Hamer in the Anglia and the Bifords MGB. Next morning, there were tales to tell of those who weren't quite so well placed. We came around this corner, and um, there was a guy in the middle of the road uh, lost control and just went straight into us. So uh, we stopped and uh, Took all his details and everything, and he accepted responsibility, which was nice. And uh, then we got on our way. Dropped uh, 15 minutes. Was he Belgian? He was Luxemburger. Um, I don't know whether he'd been drinking, but he didn't smell very nice. All the way from Australia have come Tony Bonetto and Richard Dutton with their immaculate frog-eyed sprite. We asked Tony why. From John Sprinzel, I've heard about the Garvia and the uh, Stelvio passes, uh, and he did this event in 91, and I thought, I've got a Sprite, I've got to do something in a Sprite, we've come over here um, and <laughs> we're expecting sunshine, beautiful bloody Europe and what do we get? Nothing but rain, probably snow today, Philip. <laughs> you looked cheerful enough yesterday though, you kept waving. Oh, well it's a sports car, you've got to have the roof on, all these girls driving around with hard tops. <laughs> the route that Dave Whittaker had carved out for day two ran south back into France for a series of tests in the Vosges Mountains before heading east across the Rhine to Baden-Baden for the overnight halt. Paul Carter leads the vintage class and is an amazing ninth overall in general classification. The Brodericks got lost yesterday, so they have a lot of ground to make up over the next few days. If you're not sure of the way, well, ask the locals. They're looking for the Col du Donon, which at over 1,700 metres is the highest point of the rally so far, but a pimple compared with what is to come in the days that lie ahead. On the first test of the day, Hartog made a 60-second mistake and dropped a tenth leaving the burbling Barracuda with an eight-second lead. Kerr and Cairns were second best here, cementing their newfound third place. Paul Carter's morning has not gone well, and he and Heather Milne-Taylor have dropped out of the top ten. The Williams Densham Lagonda is fourth in the vintage class and handicapped by failing windscreen wipers.
By evening, the spa town of Baden-Baden was welcoming the rallyists and their lurid tales of the day's events. We, have a, we had a petrol problem. Uh, one of the climbs, the first call, we just stopped in the middle of the road, no petrol. And uh, what we discovered is one petrol pump SU had gone down. We had a reserve pump already plumbed in. That didn't want to work either. Ah. So we then dismantled petrol pumps, pipes. That didn't work. Then the uh, sweeper came along ah. and Peter said, it's the SU. Oh, okay. He repaired it. it. He pulled it apart, cleaned it up, repaired it, and they're both now work. It's my fault for not doing the maintenance. <laughs> what would you do without him? Marvellous. <laughs> Marvellous guy. <laughs> The little lever is moved off one of the carburetors, so the accelerator pump's not working. So we're now trying to repair it, or Graham's trying to repair it there now, with a biro, which we've cut, we think, to the right length, so that it pushes up and works the, uh, the carburetor. What, what we've got is one of those on each carburetor, and what I'm I, we've lost the piece in between, which is off the pump, off the accelerator pump. So if I screw that into there, it's the top of a pen, I screw that in there and fill that with liquid, um, liquid steel and put the other end in and I've got one piece which should solve the problem. Fun and games today because the, um, there's a little clamp on the windscreen wiper that uh, wore out and we therefore had to do most of the oh. day without just my hand over the top. Well, just put your hand over and do that. <laughs> <laughs> We're very cold and very wet. <laughs> just when it rains or...? Just to know, it's fine now. But uh, if, if it builds up in there... But it, does it have when it's it, dry, or is it just... Is oh, it no, dry? when it's only... When it's been a, a long distance back, it's really... Never mind. Anyway, we will shut Italian's bit of art. <laughs> well, no, this is a flashlight, but this is something that has to do with the engine. We just had an hour going through Baden Bart. <laughs> Otherwise, it's been all right. Two days gone, three and a half to go, and the leaderboard looked like this. The Barracuda leads by just seven seconds. Ronnie Kerr's Cortina is eight seconds clear of the equally placed Chris Reese and Carol Vesterman. Day three's route winds its way through the Black Forest and Schwabische Alps, and after crossing the Danube at Sigmaringen, heads towards the Austrian Tyrol and its capital, Innsbruck. his way up this hill in 11th place in the vintage class, he has a five and a half minute advantage over Robert Harley's similar Bentley, here crossing the Danube. Harley is over three minutes ahead of the third place vintagent, Bernard Mulvaney's Alvis TK1260, who are just 14 seconds ahead of Roy Williams' stylishly driven Lagonda. Placed 39th overnight, Ranier and Christian Schlomp make a tremendous start to the day. They clean the first two tests. Others to make spot-on performances included David Rings with his daughter Katrina. Ollie Jorgensen with his new mount 1962 300SL. Phil Berg and Deswood Mark II. Of the front runners, it's the Bifords who falter. A poor time on Test 10 drops them three places to ninth. Shackleton and Lodge, Sunbeam Rapier, 42nd overall. Michael O'Shea and Sarah Fitzgerald, XK150. Barracuda's pace continues unabated as they cross the rolling hills of southern Germany. But Ronnie Kerr slips up on the next test, letting Hunt, Cook and Kirkham through into second, and Reese and Hamer up into third. The lunch halls at Orlandorf. Have you had your verse? Yeah, we decided to stop on the way and had a lovely German sausage. Good. Well, so you wouldn't be interested in a bit of cold pizza then right now, would you? No, no, no thanks. No, you can keep that one. Thank you. <laughs> it's 
How good is it? Brilliant. Yeah, a fantastic day today. Brilliant road through the Black Forest. Good. Couldn't have been nicer. Lovely stunning convoy. country. Stunning countryside we've seen today. We were in convoy behind three works Healy replicas. It was real authentic 60s sights. Fantastic. We enjoyed it. You know you've got this Mark Matt. Afternoon. Yes, that's well, uh, slightly what, alarming. What Mark Matt? <laughs> he doesn't know about it. No, I'm, I'm the one who's to I'm worry. <laughs> no worries, I'm a driver. Enjoy yourselves. Add six foot three navigator to E type coupe. As the evening shadows lengthened, the crews climbed up out of Val Gardena on the last but one test of the day. Kurt Lillywhite was still trying. Cars arrived in Cortina to a civic welcome. The high street closed for the occasion. Incredibly, Carter and Milne Taylor had taken the lead without a working halder. Well, we've driven all day with no halder, and uh, we've done well with no halder, but I want a halder for tomorrow. Hang on. Why don't you just leave this hanging? It goes in this side, yeah, and it goes out. It comes in there and goes out there. So we've got to get that off. So this is how the leaderboard looked at the end of day four. The Bentley is 30 seconds ahead of the Irishman in the Cortina. Arnold and Vipond are up to third at 38 seconds. The early leader Hartog has recovered to fourth at 46 seconds. Smith and Cave of fifth, nine seconds clear of Chris Reese and Malcolm Hamer. Less than a minute separates the first six cars. There's all to play for. With loads lightened, they're based in Cortina now for three nights, they're set off next day for a circular tour of the Dolomites. Talk at the first control was still of yesterday's halderless driving. Is it a puncture? No, it's just bull tires. Of course. Yeah. I like the mutual aid. We help each other. Yeah. yeah. Oh, got it, you again. Yeah. <laughs> Go away. This man's winning at the moment, leading the whole rally oh, in this thing. Up. Can you believe it? You can only do your best. Overall. Overall? Oh, yes, 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 yes. By Pressure. Much? Yeah. Uh, 30 seconds, I think. But we went all day yesterday with no halder. We lost all the water outside of the engine at the top of the Stelvia. Didn't use the engine all the way down the hill. Filled it up with water and it came out the side of the engine. Two loose nuts, tightened the nuts, and the water stopped coming out the side of the engine. Not too again. What was Amazing. Like, what was it like down the Gavia? Uh, it was narrow road. Hairy. It was narrow. And the brake fades. You know, once you've pressed the brakes four times, you lose the brakes completely. But uh, you go down in first gear, double the clutch for first gear for the hairpins, and round you go. Let the brakes cool down, and you got brakes again. So what was wrong with the holder? So uh, the cable went. But we've cobbled together one off a TR. Had to change, change the assembly uh, unit off another car, and off we go. So we're using so. your memory, Heather, were you? And kilometre posts and <laughs> all sorts. Uh, Anything you'd be amazed at. There was even a kilometre marker on a shed going up one of them. And they don't put as many going downhill as they do uphill, uh, it would appear, you know, but uh, it was all right. It survived. The Paso de Chibiana test proved easy. Ten crews were spot on. Roy Williams and John Densham and Mayor Lagonda lose just one second, one of 15 further crews to do so. The Irishmen press on in the second place Cortina and head for the next col, ready to strike if Carter falters. In third, Sean Arnold and John Vipon. Philip Hartog is back up to fourth and he leads the 50s cars division. With their lead gone, the boys in the Barracuda can relax and have fun. James Warner, TR3A, was the man who came up with a spare cable for Carter's Halder. Thank you, James. Someone may once have said that the Classic Rally Association couldn't organise a piss-up in a brewery. Maybe so, but they can organise a jolly good driving test in one. The home to the 100-year-old Padovina Brew proved to be a marvellous venue for a touch of arm twirling.
The gyrations made little impact on the order, but a few names came to attention. Angus Laird shared fastest time. The Shakbara Tiger was just a second slower. Maximum time. Five minutes, went the wrong bloody way. Yeah. Oh, okay. On now west towards Trento and yet more hills to climb and passes to cross. Gerald Simpson and Anthony Harvey lie a respectable 41st overall and third best novice. Stephen Roberts and Anthony Odoms, Mercedes 230SL. Well, we won't mention their position. Peter Baker hustles his Fulvia Zagato up the next col. The Stuart Murray Mark II is 28th overall and 5th in class. You remember Peter Brennan and Alan Pettit who got run into by a drunken Luxemburger on day one. Well, they don't really mind if they hit the wall. That side of the car is damaged already. Dave Whittock's found a stretch of gravel. Hooray! We can hang the tail out a bit. The Aussie Sprite is still running strongly, though they run into a non-competing car the following morning and drop over 20 places. Back in Cortina, it's nearly dark as the Brodericks check in 49th. They'll make up no less than 14 places on the final loop in the morning. Carter and Milne Taylor are still in the lead and Heather has enjoyed her day. Oh, I thought that was brilliant, although we had to shunt three times on the road going up. So it was getting a bit frantic. And then when we hit the rough stuff, of course, I, I'm hanging onto the side of the car and I couldn't actually, you know, keep track of the, the, the... I couldn't... My finger was jumping on the speed tables and I was having a job to see the clip. And then, of course, the mud flew up and I'd got one eye full of... Well, then I'm working on one eye then. But it was really great fun. I mean, it was, it was good, that. Next morning, and it's back to the clouds. The big Bentley taking a well-deserved win. The first vintage car ever to win a classic marathon. Second overall, Ronnie Kerr and Robert Cairns. Sean Arnold has dropped back, so up to third has come the erstwhile leader, Philip Hartog. The 50s cars have easier time allowance, so he doesn't mind the new fourth place man, Michael Darcy, blowing him off. Jan Abus and Lester van der Zaar make a late run from ninth to finish fifth, just about as good as they could hope for after their early error. Finishing in sixth place overall, the Healy 3000 of Derek Skinner and Richard Dix, 39 seconds ahead of Chris Hunt Cook and David Kirkham. Eighth overall, John Smith with the everlasting Willie Cave. In at nine, the Williamson's Healy 3000, and rounding off the top ten, Jeffrey O'Neill and Nigel Hutchinson. prize for the best novice crew went to Stuart Tate and David Emerson. As he waits for the Champers, how does the winner feel? Fantastic, but oh, what a drive on the rain. Unbelievable, I've got no tread on the back tyres. Making the time, we were just all over the road, understeering, oversteering, all over the place, but we got here and I think we've done it. So, uh, very happy and very relieved, but oh, what a trip. Another one for Ireland. We came to finish and this is just unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's a fairy tale. A fairy tale. Well done, bro. Thank you very much indeed. Cortina comes to Cortina. 
Ronica, second place. Third overall, the 50th anniversary of the Lancer Aurelia from Holland, Philip Hartog and Marianne Heemskirk, third overall in the Lancer Aurelia. The Lancer Aurelia takes third overall. Well, uh, the speeds they gave us, uh, there was times where we had to drive pretty quickly, yeah. You enjoyed it though? Had a great time. Uh, He's an Ulster man. <laughs> He's bound to have enjoyed it. Are you an Ulster man? I was born in Belfast, you oh, see, and the, these yeah. fellas here make me talk Irish from time to time. And he does it so well, he hasn't lost it. No, no, yeah. If those Canadians heard me talking now, they wonder who the hell I yeah, was. This time, uh, as you know, we led the rally right out of the, from the first day onward, and uh, if it hadn't have been for the carburetor thing, we, we had this one win. So it's a great car. It's just uh, a couple of bugs have held us back. Uh, we think people here uh, in Europe are wonderful. They know how to rally. Uh, uh, we have nothing like this in the United States or Canada, and we think it's a great privilege to be able to come here and, and compete with some really fine people and some really quick drivers, too. 33rd overall. That was a fantastic rally. Was it? I, that's the best rally I've been involved with. We normally don't finish. These old bangers have done really well, got us to the end. I love the bit with the, with the map for navigating. I love that bit over the gravel yesterday. And this morning was challenging. If you get something and you make it 72 years ago and it weighs two tons and then you put bolt tyres on the back and a complete spare overdrive unit, 40 gallons of fuel in it, with no brakes and then it rains, it is serious fun. We've been round spinning, feathering, feathering the throttle, I think that's the word they use, absolutely perfect. Thank you very much, Philip.